This film is brought to you by the New York Mets and Manufacturers Hanover Trust Company. It's good to have a great bank behind you. And for the Mets, 1967 was the year of change. The biggest change of all came at the end of the season. Gil Hodges, one of New York's all-time baseball heroes, came home to manage the Mets. The fans wanted him. The Mets paid big for him. Hodges replaced Wes Westrom, who started the year with high hopes in Florida. After all, he had lifted them to ninth the year before. And now the Mets had picked up Tommy Davis, a former batting champ, a real 300 hitter, and an experienced starting pitcher, Don Cardwell. The Mets could make moves now. They could experiment, try things, like Ken Boyer at first if needed. And they had bright young talent, such as Tom Seaver. Yes, the outlook was bright for the Mets fans, and when the team came home from Florida, the new breed turned out in force to welcome them. Pitcher Don Shaw and shortstop Bud Harrelson and all the rest were honored by fans from all walks of life, from the executives of large companies to the bleacher fans from neighboring states and the five boroughs. For that is what the New York Mets are all about. And the next day, the dawn came bright with hope and Shea was filled with people and with more hope. And they did see some great wonders during the season. Ron Swoboda swing. And two runs come in. And Juan Marichal is beaten for the first time by the amazing Mets. Off to the shower. Things were going well for the Mets. The new men were really coming through. And the Mets were making things happen. And making other teams lose their cool. Sometimes you could hardly tell which team was which. Yes, there was much reason to rejoice. And then, suddenly, things began to happen. Things that gave some people the strangest feeling that they had seen this before and gave New Met President Bing Devine cause for concern. We've admitted that we had a somewhat disappointing year. Uh, there were some good, as always, there were some high points in the season, uh, particularly in the performance and the coming around, so to speak, of young ball players such as Tom Seaver. A uh, fine young right-handed pitcher, Bud Harrelson, who seemed almost overnight, certainly over the previous winter, to have matured into a regular, full-time, everyday big league ball player, and Ron Swoboda, whom it had been supposed might well have to spend part or all of another year in the minor leagues, gaining a little more experience, uh, with the opportunity presented, came along well as a big league outfielder and improved in all the departments in which he was having problems for some time past. Best of all the good things was Tom Seaver. He was to win 16 games. He was to become National League Rookie of the Year. There was nothing, it seemed, that this young man could not do. Fielding, hitting, and hustling. The Mets players have their fan clubs, and when Tom Seaver showed up to meet his, they turned out they were crazy about him. Especially this one. How many home runs did you have? How many home runs did you have? 
have you hit, Tom? I won. In my lifetime, have I hit? I hit 10 when I was a little later. How many home runs have you given up? More than I've hit. Yeah. And here's one of those homers Tom Seaver spoke about. It's Willie McCovey making the giant fans happy. And we still have a few of them at Big Shea. But Tom gradually learned to handle the big hitters with success. Uh, pitching to the to the stars in the league is a is a great experience for me, and it's a it's a great challenge to me personally. Um, take for instance Willie Mays. Now uh, I used to go to San Francisco and watch Willie Mays when I was in high school, when I was in junior high. I used to watch him from the uh, from the stands, and uh, he was a tremendous ball player to me. And now when I uh, go to the mound, I've got to get him out. I'm the one that has to try and get him out for this club, and uh, I try to uh, move the ball in and out on Willie and keep him uh, loose on the plate and keep the ball down. I think that he likes uh, he likes the ball up where he can, has a chance to get at it, and I try and throw uh, hard stuff away from him, uh, sliders down and away, and I try and throw fastballs down and uh, possibly have him uh, swing and miss or. Uh, hit the ball in the ground and, and get the ground ball. I think if uh, to Willie to get the ball up, he's got a good chance of, of getting the ball out of the park. That's the kind of pitching that earned young Tom Seaver a trip to Anaheim Stadium and a place on the 1967 All-Star team. There's a special excitement to an All-Star game. Even the old pros feel it. Men like Casey Stengel and George Weiss, who never cease to be thrilled. Even the players speak about feeling the butterfly. There's our man, Seaver, calmly chewing some of Mr. Wrigley's specialty. Well, uh, the All-Star, being picked to the All-Star game wasn't uh, the biggest thrill that I've ever had in my entire life as far as, as baseball is concerned. Um, it was just a, a tremendous, it was like a dream being picked for the team. And as I sat in the bullpen, uh, the game kept going into extra innings, and I felt that possibly uh, if it went a few more, you know, I said, well, keep going, and I'll have a chance to get in, because uh, at one point, it reached a point where Drysdale and, and Claude Osteen and myself were the only ones left in the bullpen, and I felt that uh, uh, since Claude had pitched two days previous, uh, uh, 11 innings, I don't, I didn't think that he could, could pitch, and so uh, I felt if Drysdale went in, and, and the game went maybe up to 14 or 15 innings, that I would get a shot. And then suddenly came his big chance. National League leads two to one, last of the 15th, and the kid gets the call to save the game. I believe Tony Caniglero was a first hitter, and uh, I tried to keep the ball in on him so he couldn't hit the home run, and uh, as a result, he hit a, he hit a fly ball left field, I think it was, and the next hitter was Jastrzemski, and I was gonna be very careful with Carl, to tell you the truth, I didn't want to walk him. I mean, I didn't want to have a chance with or he'd hit a home run, I'd rather have, I would have rather walked him, and as it turned out, I did walk him, and uh, he ended up on first base, and then uh, uh, Billy Freehand uh, I faced in spring training, and I felt that I was throwing uh, fairly hard, then I felt that I could get the ball in on him, and, and ran the ball in, and he, and he hit the ball to center field, a Willie caught, and then the uh, Ken Berry was a pinch hitter, and uh, he was the last uh, pinch hitter that the American League could have used, and uh, I remember before I left here in New York, in, uh, from New York, Jack LeMabe told me, he said, throw Ken Burry fastballs inside and throw him sliders outside. And it kind of amused me to see him walking up there. And I immediately recalled what Jack had told me. So I threw a fastball inside and a uh, slider away and a fastball and struck him out on four pitches. And, and the game was over. And there was chaos in the clubhouse and shaking hands. and. The biggest thrill I think I had was uh, us going down the clubhouse steps and Henry Aaron slapped me on the back. Then there is another popular myth. The kids are crazy about him, and he loves them. Nobody in baseball tries harder than Ron Swoboda. Lord, how he tries. Tries. Now, there was some uh, belief that my outfielding needed a little bit of work. Well, okay, we gave it a, we gave it a good shot in spring training. 
And during the year, I never let up on the work. Uh, before a ball game, almost every day at home, and quite a few times on the road, we get out there with the fungo bat, and Sheriff Robinson uh, and I worked uh, very hard on this. And uh, believe it or not, we started getting some results. And I guess the biggest turning point was uh, having the chance to make a few outstanding plays in a ball game. And this is what really builds your confidence up, having the chance to a uh, key situation, a, a tough play where you have to make the right move at the right time, uh, making the play, and then really feeling uh, the uh, sense of accomplishment from that. Uh, hitting was another thing. I, I wasn't sure uh, that the hitting was coming around. It kind of started a little bit slowly, and uh, gradually I started to feel myself, and things started falling in place, and I found myself able to look for a certain kind of pitch or maybe uh, pick an area out in which I wanted the ball to be pitched in, and if it was in that area, then I was lucky enough to hit it. And uh, this is something that uh, you know as a hitter, but it's uh, more than just knowing it. You have to learn how to do it. And uh, knowing what you have to do and doing it is, is quite often a uh, different proposition. The search for other Ryan Swobodas, other Tom Seavers goes on. There may be one here in this remote high school field in the south. Now that is the mission of Whitey Herzog, Met Super Scout, to follow up the tips. You can never be sure where the next big one is coming from. Maybe it's Danny Haynes. He has power, and word gets around fast. The Scouts are impressed. Here's a good one. Terry Hughes. Spartanburg, South Carolina. They say he's the best high school prospect in the land. In colleges, the crowds are bigger, and the fields are better, and the players are better. Like Gary Hill of North Carolina, a fine pitcher, a little more mature, and Scott Herzog must take that into consideration. Yankee scouts Harry Kraft and Atlee Donald are interested. They like this fellow. He's Ron Blomberg, who can hit that ball. Lots of clubs are interested in him, but the Yankees have the best shot since they have the first pick. Now it's back to the office to talk over what they've seen. Whitey Herzog reports to Bob Sheffing and Joe McDonald, top men in the Mets player development system. I think six or seven of them are going to be as pitchers drafted. I'm sure the Yankees are going to take Blomberger Hughes. I've got a good shot at Blomberg, Joe. I, I like him. He can run. He's a big kid, got a quick bat with a lot of power. And I feel he could be an outstanding big league ball player. And uh, I knew I couldn't get Hughes, and I had one look at him. Watched him work out a couple of times. And uh, I knew he'd be gone before number four, so I really never went back to see him again. But In analyzing and predicting what the earlier drafting clubs will do, Whitey Herzog seems to think the Mets' best bet is to make John Matlack, left-handed pitcher, their first-round pick. Boston is third pick, and they might take the boy from Westchester, Matlack. He's a pitcher. He's the one high school boy I've seen. When you say he strikes out 15 guys, he strikes them out throwing strikes. He's in the strike zone all the time. He's 6'3". He's only 17. He's going to get quicker. He has an average big league fastball now and a pretty good curveball. And for his age, his poise and his control is better than any young pitcher I've ever seen. So I'd say that... Uh, of all the kids I've seen, if I had to pick the top five in the country right now, and we're going to have to wait to see who the other three teams take, I'd say Blomberg, Hughes, Gorman, Matlack, and Meyer. They'd be right there in the top five, and we're going to have to talk about, do we want to sign a Meyer and send him out now to play, or get a Matlack and hold him back and then send him to the instruction? The day of decision arrives. Top baseball men assemble at New York's Hotel Americana. General William Eckert, Commissioner of Baseball, opens the meeting. It proved to be a fruitful two days for each of you and for all of professional baseball in con the continuing search for major league players. Mr. Seeger, will you call the roll? Yankees. Hmm. The Yankees select the negotiation rights to Ronald Mark Lumberg. As predicted, the Yankees select Ron Blomberg. 18 years of age. And the Cubs take Terry Hughes. 185. While the Red Sox go for Mike Garman, the big right-hander. 
Now it's the Mets' turn. Jonathan Matlack, M-A-T, L-A. They get their man, John Matlack, and they seem pleased. Now it's down to Florida and the instructional league for young Mr. Matlack. There he meets other bright Met prospects, fellows like Les Rohr. Matlack goes right to work, firing his fastball at rookies from other teams. Kids also rush to Florida for accelerated development. After Gil Hodges was appointed manager, the first thing he did was fly down to Florida for a look-see. The first trip that I spent in Florida was three days and uh, had an opportunity to see uh, some of the real young people uh, in the Met organization and uh, some of the boys that's on the roster of the big league club. Uh, I was impressed with uh, three or four people, uh, one of them being uh, the right-handed pitcher by the name of Rinko. And uh, this fellow could possibly scare a few fellows just walking out on the mound. He's so big. But it, uh, on top of that, he has some ability, too. He throws a ball real well, has a pretty good curve ball, and uh, I'm anxious to see him in spring training. Uh, another fellow that uh, impressed me that uh, was the big boy that uh, Nolan Ryan, the right-handed pitcher. Uh, I saw him pitch five innings uh, in St. Petersburg, and uh, he threw the ball real well, and uh, well enough for me. At Gil Hodges has reason for cheer. The Mets youngsters won 30, lost 20, finishing second by one game to Detroit. Sometimes a team will instruct a regular to brush up on his bunny or to experiment with a new position. Here's Bud Harrelson, hard at work against Iron Mike. Bunning is, is I think, overrated as far as people think it's easy. If you've got speed, it's easy to bunt. I disagree with him. I think bunning is probably more of an art than hitting. For the simple reason, uh, any, any fellow that can bunt, you can see what they do to the infield. So, actually, once you have the infield in uh, the way that they play me, then it would be easier for me to, to make contact, to try to hit the ball a little harder. Uh, now I've got a better chance than actually bunting. I've got to make a perfect bunt. Uh, I'm talking about being left-handed because uh, as far as right-handed right bunting, You've got to have the infield back. Once in a while, I'll bump the infield in because the situation calls for a bump. I've always had good speed on the bases, uh, but I think uh, it's just the ability to, to uh, learn, learn your pitchers, getting jumps, and this is something that actually nobody has, no one has ever worked with me on. Uh, Tommy Davis has helped me quite a bit this year. Uh, of course, one of the better men on stealing bases with Maury Wills and uh, Tommy played with him for a few years. Davis's performance as a Met exceeded expectations, but it soon became apparent that the Mets still had to strengthen themselves in center field. In the last change of 1967, Davis was traded for 1966 American League Rookie of the Year, Tommy Agee, an exceptionally fast man with good power. Although Agee did not hit for average last year, Gil Hodges is confident he will show considerable improvement in 68. Uh, another boy that uh, should be improving is uh, Ed Cranepool. I think Eddie, uh, when we signed him, I was on the Mets at that time in uh, 1962, and of course everyone liked him. I know that uh, he's hit well in the minor leagues, and uh, since he's been here, I believe he's been a little above 250, but he is showing signs of... Eddie Cranepool is a young veteran. He was 17 when he became a Met. Now he is 23 and knows his way around the league. Maybe possibly 300. Certainly all of us are hoping Cranepool can do that this year. No, our ball club has kind of suggested to me last year to kind of improve myself as far as average-wise. And that's what I was doing for most of the year. Of course, you'll notice that my reduction in the home runs is from 16 to what I have right now. But uh, what I did improve is average, and this is what I wanted to do next year. My RBIs didn't suffer very much, and I don't think it's going to from now on, but uh, I'd like to hit 280 to 300 in this league, and I think it's the opportunity a young fellow has. The more he gets on base, the more he can help his ball club, and every young fellow on our ball club wants to win, and we expect to win and uh, show it to our fans who have supported us for five years. That's what the Mets have more than anything, fans. Great fans. Banner-carrying fans. Picture-taking fans. Cap-wearing fans. A 
autograph-seeking fan. Music-loving fan. Dancing fan. Hello there. Singing fan. And watching every action at Shea is Jim Thompson, vice president in charge of keeping people happy. The main objective is, because of these wonderful fans, which naturally started back in the polo grounds, and uh, how they first started with the banners coming in and, and started with the children on up to the parents, and even the parents are carrying banners today. Uh, I have seen the fans at Ebbets Field, Yankee Stadium, and I have never seen a fan like a Met fan. Even the players join in the extracurricular fun. Their big kick is family day when their sons play a ball game. Here's Bob Johnson showing his future major leaguer how to do it. During the off season, the Mets traded Bob to Cincinnati for Art Shamsky. But you can bet that Whitey Herzog and Bob Sheffing will be keeping an eye on that Johnson kid. An annual favorite with the fans is Old Timers Night. And here's old timer Casey Stingle with his friend George Weiss and their young friend. There's Homer, the canine old timer from the Mets' first year. And somebody remembers a sometime hero. Now there's an old timer who can still swing that bat. Way to go, Yogi. Turnabout is fair play. And every once in a while, the Mets go to see the fans. Now here they are making a special off-season trip to Scranton, Pennsylvania. That's Al Jackson with yours truly. Alvin likes being a Mets so much, he's back for a second helping. The kids get snazzy in Met caps and ice cream. And of course, autographs. But always, the real work goes on. At the minor league training camp, the future Mets must learn baseball fundamentals. Slide left, slide right, slide both ways. And always, that look into the future for the day the Mets will fight for the pennant. The uh, whole purpose of running a ball club is to develop young ball players that eventually will come to the major league level. It's my belief that we have successfully competed with other major league clubs in the minor league field during the 1967 season. This is Johnny Murphy. Now the responsibility is his. In a dramatic development, the year of change produced a whopper. Bing Devine returned to St. Louis and passed the building blueprint over to Johnny Murphy. Priscilla, Heiss, Boswell, and Otis. I believe these fellows will be in the major leagues very soon, if not in 1968. And the, I know with Whitey Herzog running the minor league operation, and with Gil Hodges as our now new Met manager, why, I expect great things for the future. The young ones come on and battle for big league stardom. Danny Frisella gets up and tries again. Outfielder Amos Otis on the left was impressive in his brief trial at the end of last season. Watch this peg. He's out. This is Bob Heiss, who batted over 300 while a Met. Perfect hit and run play. And Harrelson goes into third. Kenny Boswell, who many feel is on the verge of becoming a major leaguer. Some of the new Mets confidence comes from the performance of youngsters like these. Unmistakable talent that gives bright hope. The year of change is past. The change never stops. And excitement never stops. And hope never dies. See you at Shea.
film has been brought to you by Borden's Farm Products of New York, who make Borden's Swiss-style yogurt. The yogurt with a real fruit flavor stirred all the way through. And Borden's Milk and other fine dairy products. Look for all these items at your favorite food store. Remember, if it's Borden's, it's got to be good.